welcome. Welcome to Startup Scale Up. Thank you all for being here. It is going to be a fantastic day. Let me introduce myself real quick. My name is Mike Marchetti. I'm a venture partner at Jumpstart. And I just moved here from San Francisco. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Moved here four months ago. Um, I worked at, uh, I was out in the Bay Area for about 15 years. I worked for Yahoo and Yelp uh, during some pretty critical years and really got to see a lot of the hyper growth. Um, but I'm also very excited to be here in the Cleveland region. Everybody's been super nice, super connecting. I think this is an incredible community, and uh, I'm looking forward to working with a lot of you guys out there today. So, a couple administrative things before I introduce this individual. We've got uh, two microphones here in the front. We're going to take questions. We're going to go for about 45 minutes, have a dialogue, and then uh, we're going to leave a little time for questions at the end. So, if you have that dying question, um, we'll be taking it at the end. So, let me introduce uh, Mr. Alex Bard. He, I like to call him the quadruple threat. <laughs> okay, you haven't heard that before. No, I haven't, no. So, can I use that? Yeah, you can. Okay, so the perfect. quadruple threat, right, it's for two reasons. One, he has started and exited four companies. He started his first company when he was 21 years old. Uh, he co-founded his first company when he was 21 years old. He sold his third company in 2004 to AOL, to America Online. And he sold his last company in 2013, is that? 2011. 2011. He sold his last company to salesforce.com. Um, so he's, you know, um, he somehow has figured out the magic, okay? The second reason why I call him the quadruple threat, and you don't see a lot of entrepreneurs that have done this, but he's played four different roles. He's been an entrepreneur, obviously. He uh, reported to Mark Benioff at Salesforce for three years. So on an executive team at a fairly large, fairly large company. He uh, recently was the CEO at a company called Campaign Monitor. And lastly, he just recently, I think it's been 11 days. 11 days, that's he's right. He's at Redpoint and he's a VC, he's a partner at Redpoint Ventures. So the last thing I will say, and then I'll wrap up this intro, is uh, I've known Alex for about 12, 13 years. Uh, like I said, I've been in the Bay Area for 15 years and Alex is, so, though very successful, one of the most humble, nicest guys I know from the Bay Area. Please help me in welcoming Alex Bard. Um, <laughs> after that intro, it's all done if I'm here, yeah. right? I like, uh, I like that you've got a shirt that matches the logo. So that well, was, so that was the point. That yeah. was exactly right. Um, thank you so much for, for having me here. As, as Mike said, I've known him for a long time. And, and when he called and told me he had moved to Cleveland, after the initial shock wore off, and then I understood why he did it, um, and he said he was helping put on this event, I was absolutely happy to sort of join and, and be part of this incredible community that I know is now growing and vibrant and has so much, uh, so much potential. So thank you so much for having me here. Good. So let's jump right into it. Let's do it. Um, like I said before, like I said in his intro, he started four companies. Three of those companies were in the customer success arena or customer success platforms. Mm -hmm. I think most people would be pretty excited about starting one company, exiting one company that's in the customer success area, right? You did three. That sounds crazy. Why would you do <laughs> three companies in the same space and what made them successful? Uh, yeah, so so actually I didn't sort of set out to be um, an expert in customer support or, or customer success. Uh, although I'm sure like the rest of you, when you have a great support experience, you know it and it builds a much greater affinity for the company that delivered it. The, the, the way that my sort of story started is I stumbled into it. When I graduated college, uh, I was very much left brain. I love math and, and science. I was also right brain, very sort of artistic and creative. I was probably the only uh, kid in high school who bought Barron's, which is this big, thick, heavy sort of financial paper, and I would read stock quotes on, on the weekends. And so I loved math and numbers, and the first job I had out of college, I grew up in New York, uh, was actually on Wall Street, uh, and I got a job uh, at Dean Witter, uh, which was in the 73rd floor of World Trade Number 2, and this was in 1996. Um, and so I was going through that, I was going through the training program there, it's what I thought I'd always wanted, uh, and it turned out that uh, while I loved the math and sort of science, part of it, it was really constricting in terms of the, the creativity. And a good friend of mine from junior high school, high school and college, who was a brilliant programmer, uh, gave me a call and said, hey, I'm thinking about starting this company. 
Um, and the idea behind the company, if you sort of mentally rewind back to 1996, AOL dominated, right? A lot of people's first experience with what was the internet was through AOL. Uh, and one of the big things that people used to do on AOL is connect with one another and communicate, right, through chat and, and forums. And so my friend's idea, his name's Brad Birnbaum, um, was to effectively take that community platform and democratize it so that any website uh, on the internet could start to build community. And that was a big idea uh, sort of at the time. And it sounded like a great idea to me. Um, and so I left and, and joined this company. And I helped run product uh, for the company. But again, the original idea of the company was to build communities and forums. And we did so for Lycos and GeoCities, uh, which is where I actually met your brother, uh, and a lot of other great companies. And it was going really well. Now, the company was based on Long Island at the time. Um, and at the time, there was another company on Long Island that was one of the leaders in this new sort of e-commerce movement. Remember, the internet had, had just recently sort of come around. And that was a company called 1-800-Flowers. And they were really successful on the internet at the time. And they saw what we were doing with this chat and community software. And they came to us and said, well, could you take what you're doing, which is connecting many people simultaneously to one another, but could you use it so that a support agent could help someone through the buying process so that they could chat to multiple people simultaneously, but for each person in the process, it seemed to be sort of an individual conversation. And that was really interesting to us. That's not how we thought about the business when we first started. But this is this idea of really being open-minded and listening to customers, helping customers sort of in some ways define your path. Now, you can get caught you know, in a rabbit hole chasing a customer, but when you combine sort of customer demand with macro trends, and this was this idea that more and more people were going to sell online and they were going to want to have a support experience as part of it, then you can start to formulate a hypothesis around, is this a good path to take for the company? And we did that. We decided to do it. We experimented with it. We, we ran both products sort of simultaneously, but ultimately that became uh, what that company, which was called eShare, became really known for. We became one of the leaders uh, in sort of support and success yeah. for companies moving online. Yeah. That's an interesting strategy, right? So you basically had one concept, you found a customer and they had a slightly different need, and then you started to evolve your product because you saw the need there. Exactly right. right? Yep. Different, different type of strategy. So that was your first company, right? You did that in 1996, you came back what, a few years later, and you started another customer success right. platform. So that, that company uh, was around from 96 to 1999, and in 1999, which was sort of the, hot, the height of the, the dot-com era, it was acquired uh, by a public company. Uh, and it was a public company based out of Atlanta that did these uh, sort of old predictive dialers. Predictive dialers, like American Express would use it, or large uh, firms would use it to automatically dial a bunch of phone numbers, and when somebody connected on the other line, it, they would connect them with an agent. Mm -hmm. So it was more of a sort of a marketing function. And they acquired the company and changed their name to eShare, and eShare became uh, the public technology brand. Uh, at the time, I met uh, a couple of other entrepreneurs who were actually based in San Diego. And they were starting uh, a company, and they were thinking about the concept for this company, and it was the evolution of what we were doing at eShare. So eShare was really predominantly support through chat and, and email. The idea behind this company was to evolve it so that all of the various support channels lived in one CRM mm -hmm. and gave you sort of a 360 degree view of the customer. And so I was really excited about you know, that opportunity and that vision. I wanted to start something new. I took two of my friends who helped co-found eShare, and we moved out uh, to the west coast of San Diego to start this company uh, called eAssist, which again was sort of a broad-based CRM, customer relationship management, but optimized for support. Ironically, it was around the same time that Mark Benioff started Salesforce.com, which was CRM, but mostly optimized around uh, a sales business process. Now, that, that sort of journey it was an incredibly, uh, I, I, I call it textured and interesting journey. Um, if you start a company in 1999, you know, there, there were seven of us. We raised $78 million in the first year. $78 million. Uh, grew to 300 people, opened offices in San Diego, Toronto, which is where one of the, the co-founders and CEO was from, opened an office in London. I lived in both cities to help hire the country manager. And we got spun up really quickly. We built up momentum. I, I fundamentally think the most important word in business is momentum. And momentum is infectious, both positive and negative. And we, we had tremendous positive momentum because, again, if you think about what was happening then, you had all these dot-com companies forming, raising a bunch of money, starting to sell products, and then needing to support those customers. And so we 
had some of the largest brands at the time come on board uh, of our platform, which was the exciting part of what I call a very <laughs> uh, textured journey. Then we filed to go public. We had a billion dollar um, offering price. We had three of the best banks, CSFB, DLJ, and H&Q, sort of as our tombstone, ready to take us public. I was in my mid-20s, and it was a, you know, kind of an incredible experience until the dot-com crash. And it all uh, sort of exploded really quickly, and we never wound up going public. We had burned tremendous capital to get us ready for going public with the assumption that we were going to get access uh, to a lot more. And our customers, who made the business look really good because they were paying us on a recurring revenue model, all started to go out of business. Um, and so we had to make some really difficult decisions and sort of cut the company back. And in this case, we followed what some of our customers were telling us. And in this case, it was probably, in retrospect, and it's easy to do, not the best idea. And this is why I say you have to be really careful. At the time, all of our dot-com customers who were happy for us to host the solution started to go away. And the other customers that were sort of interested in this were more traditional cable companies, uh, telcos, and banks. They didn't want to entrust this system to a dot-com, which is what we were, mm -hmm. given that all of them were going out of business. And so they said, we'll use it if you can install it on-premise, which sort of took us away from the original founding vision. Um, and we felt desperate at the time, and so we followed that path. And I think ultimately that path led to you know, an exit of the company, which was not a great exit. Mm -hmm. We sold it for a fraction of, of what we raised because that implementation was incredibly hard and difficult. We couldn't iterate on the product vision as quickly as we had hoped because we were installing it on premise. And you can see Mark Benioff stayed with his original vision and stayed true to it at Salesforce and has built you know, sort of a tremendous company. So that was that, was that outcome. <laughs> yep. So then you, in 2009, you created a Sisley, mm -hmm. okay. um, a third customer success platform, right? yep. and at the time there's Zendesk, we're probably all pretty familiar with Zendesk, um, it was a behemoth, right? I mean, it was getting market share, it was growing very fast, um, and you, you basically went up against Zendesk, right? Oh, take us through that thought process and strategy. So um, at the time, I was at AOL. AOL had acquired my, my previous company, and we'll, we'll chat about that at some point. Um, but I was at AOL, and I, and I recognized that that was not the place for me. It was just a, a different era at the company. It was moving to more of a media company than a technology company, and I was starting to think about doing something new and different. And the way that I, I did that, I didn't set off to, again, do a support company. I sort of stepped back, and I looked at what were the megatrends that were, were, were kind of occurring. Yep. And one of those megatrends early was, was social media and Twitter. And if you looked at some of the early usage on, on Twitter, it was people going and talking to brands that they never really had access to talk to before. And it was you know, either complaining about an experience that they had or celebrating a great experience that they had. Through and the social platforms. Through, through the, the social platform channel. Exactly, through the social platforms, which was public. And so the, the, the impact radius of a, of a customer experience became much greater because more and more people could see it than sort of um, ever before. And that, that sort of triggered something in my mind with my original co-founders that this was going to change the idea of what support meant inside of a company from a department to a philosophy. And more and more companies would start to focus on this, this customer experience. And so that was really exciting for us. So we looked at that. And nobody was really doing it as sort of a first-class channel as it related to all the ways that they communicated with customers. So that was one part of it. Another part, back to this idea that support was going to be more of a philosophy than a department, was that more and more people in the company would get involved in that process outside of the people who were primarily responsible for it. And so we came up with a unique and innovative pricing model that enabled everybody inside of a company to participate without it being sort of cost prohibitive. And then finally, we built an interface that I, that I thought was uniquely positioned to help our customers serve their customers better. Mm -hmm. uh, the way that we came up with all this is, is sort of around this one principle that I think about. When there's an incumbent, and you talked about Zendesk being an incumbent, I think the way that you win is not trying to do what they do a little bit better. Uh, Mark Cuban was an investor in that one company we hadn't really talked about yet, and he, he would always challenge me uh, when we'd have board meetings, and he would say, I don't want an er or an est from you, which he didn't want me to say, this is better, we're doing this better, uh, or this is, we're doing this the best. He wanted to hear how fundamentally different we were being or how we were thinking about things where the competitor, in fact, couldn't do it because it would be too disruptive to their own mm -hmm. business. It's this idea of using their strength, like in judo, yep. their momentum and strength sort of um, They've grown too them. big. They've grown too big and they're less agile. 
It's too big, less agile, and they couldn't, for example, em embrace that, uh, the pricing model mm -hmm. because it would have corroded their revenue stream. And we could because we were day zero. And I'll, I'll tell you right. an interesting story sort of to, to kind of connect this about a couple of other companies that, do that did this, I, I think, really well. Take Google, for example. At the time that Google launched, people thought search engines were dead. That was it. Why would you launch another search engine? And search engines had actually evolved into more portals than search engines. There was a search bar at the top, but then they had filled out all these, con you know, all this other content, right. and created all these partnerships for weather and news and commerce and everything else, right? Yahoo, you know, a company you're very familiar with, and, and, and a handful of others. Well, what Google launched was an incredibly simple, fast search bar. They knew that Yahoo and all these other guys, outside of their al algorithm being better, which you could argue, could never go back to that super simple search experience. Right. Right. That was one of those sort of judo moves. I'll tell you, you know, sort of one more and we'll move on. Salesforce.com, everybody thinks that, you know, what made Salesforce so successful early on was that they built this product in the cloud. And, and Mark Benioff used to say, you know, why can't uh, using enterprise software be like shopping on Amazon. That was a big part of his idea. Mm -hmm. And that was a part of it, but the real sort of jiu-jitsu move there was the SaaS pricing model. Because the incumbents, uh, Oracle and, and Siebel and others, couldn't move to this low-cost monthly pricing model. Again, their entire sales, their go-to-market, their commission structure, their quarterly number that they had to hit had right. been so based around a, a legacy model. Yep. And so that was the real jiu-jitsu move. And so if you start about thinking about starting a business, and there's an incumbent, think about how you're going to do sort of the opposite of what they're doing to create value for a customer. And, and that's what we did, and that's why we got excited about support again and, and kind of going after it. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's interesting, right? And I think a lot of you and entrepreneurs in the room, when we think, I mean, if you're building a product, you're going to be thinking about pricing, right? And how, how are you going to sell it? Um, so we all go through that thought process. Um, what, how did you know, so you, moved, you, you mentioned you moved to an hourly, so... Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very easy you buy a user license, right, or a named license. You move to an hourly, which I don't even know another product out there yeah. that does that. How did you know that that's what the customers wanted, what the customers needed? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So I'll, I'll sort of start by saying this. One of the, one of the great lessons that I learned uh, when I was at Salesforce is that business model can actually be a competitive advantage, not just a way for you to get value back for value that you deliver. And most entrepreneurs don't think about innovating through business model as a competitive advantage. Now, there have been some interesting innovations, SaaS pricing, freemium, et cetera. But, but really, when you're starting your business, can business model actually be a competitive advantage for you uh, against an incumbent? So when we were interviewing customers early, so how did we come up with the hourly pricing? There, there's this uh, professor, he was an entrepreneur, professor, uh, author called Steve Blank. And he wrote this book, Four Steps to an Epiphany. Mm -hmm. And it was this idea, like one of the central themes was, get out of the building, which is stop trying to build what you think is the best product. Get out of the building, get out of your own mind, and meet with customers, and have them co-develop this product for you. Um, and so there's now another uh, author called Eric Ries that's taken it further, which is now the lean movement. And so it's about this, you know, iterating really quickly instead of waiting for the perfect product. You know, mm -hmm. I think Reid Hoffman said this, which is, if you're not embarrassed uh, when you ship your first product, you've spent too much time building it, right? So it's, just, <laughs> it's sort of this, this fast iterative cycles. So what we did early on at Assisly is we had a hypothesis around, you know, sort of social media, and we tested that hypothesis. And we had a hypothesis that support was going to move, as I said, from a department to a to a philosophy and more people would be involved. So we went out and we identified 20 companies that we thought were really progressive, were really thoughtful about how they thought about customer experience, and we fought our way in, and we spent a ton of time interviewing them to try to understand if this made sense, and, and we listened a lot. We didn't sell, we, we sold to get in, but then we just listened, listened, yep. listened. And so this I, is where I'm that actually very, I'm very familiar with this, right? Because so Alex approached me in 2011 at the time, I was working for Yelp, and um, it's funny, we had about 100 customer success reps, reps at that point, and I had them all on Salesforce, and we were completely customizing Salesforce to do what we needed in the customer service area, and, um, and the licenses were really expensive. So I'm like, <laughs> all right, I gotta find something different. So your timing was fantastic, yeah. right? Because it was a priority for me to move these and, and, and lower our costs and find a more relevant system for these, these users. Um, so you approached us and said, hey, you can use our product for free. Mm -hmm. Right, and I'm like, oh my God, the management team's going to think I'm a hero. I just got a free product, right? Yep. That's going to solve all our problems. Um, but we did, we did bring it in, and um, the irony is, you did sell it to Salesforce. So I ended up, <laughs> I ended up back on Salesforce. So I don't Sorry know if I really that. achieved anything. <laughs> 
but but I think um, I want to talk about this a little bit. It's part of you know, customers greater than revenue, yeah. right? Is is the focus? It was the focus was you were trying to get the right customers on board. So mm-hmm. talk talk me through a little bit why Yelp and some of the other examples, other companies you worked with, yeah. that you thought were the right yeah. right companies to align with. Yeah, for us. Um, we had this hypothesis, and I said we tested it with a, with a handful of companies uh, that we picked. We felt that if we could be successful at those companies, then we would be able to unlock a much bigger market. Um, and so Yelp was one of those companies. Yelp was a tremendous uh, brand. It was growing. It was building you know, incredible momentum. Startups wanted to be like Yelp. And there was a handful of those companies that in you know, sort of 2010, 2011, which was you were just coming out of the financial crisis and you started to just build momentum again, there were companies that inspired other companies, Mm -hmm. inspired both sort of entrepreneurs who were starting companies, but also inspired bigger companies because the bigger companies were looking at, well, what is Yelp doing? What is is Pandora doing? What's 37 Signals doing? Um, What's Spotify doing? And so uh, what's Bonobos doing? And these were all some of the companies that we targeted because we thought that they were not only sort of inspirational brands, but they were also the psychographic, not demographic, the psychographic of the type of customer that we were trying to serve with our product. Mm-hmm. And so when we came into Yelp, and, and we did so with, with the others, it wasn't about wanting to sell the product and to get money back for it, because that would have been incredibly short-sighted thinking mm-hmm. for us. It was about having Yelp use us for a core business process and have success in that core business process. Because if we knew that we could prove success with Yelp and a handful of other companies, then every other company would be lined up at our door wanting to use the product and, in fact, pay for the product. Yeah. And so that's what we did. Yeah. And you mentioned Bonobos was one of those as well. Mm-hmm. How, how many did you have? How many companies did you go in and say, hey, you guys use this product. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll implement it, get it up and running. I mean, even to this day, if you go to Yelp.com and you submit issues through the support, it's all now desk.com they right. renamed to sicily to desk.com yep. and that's what's you know that is what's running on the back end is, yep. is alex's product yeah we uh we kept it fairly small so i'll, I'll talk about that a little bit I, I think the total was 10 i think bonobos in our database every time a company signed up you know the, the database row went one two three mm-hmm. i think bonobos was maybe nine yelp was maybe 13 or 14 it was really early on uh but we we sort of identified a list of it was under 10. And the reason that we wanted it to be small was because we had very constrained resources, right? We were a startup, right. and we had to ensure success of every single one of these. Otherwise, we would be wasting their time, and we'd be setting ourselves up for failure. Yeah. And to ensure success early on, it's not plug in the product and, and sort of walk away. We were there all the time. I mean, we'd, we'd, we'd come to your offices oh, and yeah. sit with the agents. It wasn't sitting with the executive sponsors. I mean, we did yeah. that too. But it was sitting with the agents, seeing what their experience was, seeing what worked, seeing what didn't work. And that level of sort of investment into a partner, and that's how we viewed Yelp as a partner, not a customer, is, is uh, intense. Yeah. And you can only do so many. Yeah. Otherwise, it all starts to fall apart. So we had under 10. Yep. And, so, and to a certain extent, right, getting users on was key, mm-hmm. right? It was probably more valuable at the time than revenue was, yep. right? You want to get users on it. Um, you can sell that to investors or, or any company you're talking mm-hmm. to, right? Um, you just want people using the product, right? right. Just finding issues. I, I remember us, right? We, uh, our head of our customer success team, I think, called you guys at least five times a day, yep. right? Just yep. issue, issue, issue. And you got, you said, you know, it was almost embarrassing, right? Well, opportunity, we, opportunity, opportunity. Opportunity, <laughs> opportunity. There you go. So... Um, okay, so then what point do you go, oh, we can build for this now, right? We've mm-hmm. achieved this point of we feel like it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a pretty pretty significant product. And- yeah, I, I don't think there, there's ever sort of an exact scientific formula. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what we did. We um, started onboarding sort of our, our first handful of customers that we hyper-focused on um, in January of um, 2010. Um, and we, we worked closely with those customers for three, four months until we felt like we had sort of a great product and solution. We rolled the product out publicly where anybody could sign up for it in June of 2010. Right. And we didn't charge anybody until October of 2010. And so even once we sort of opened up the floodgates and let anybody come in, sign up, procure the product themselves and use it, we were very clear that we were going to give it away until we had the comfort that 
uh, we were delivering enough value and there were no issues, and not, I mean, there'll never be no issues, right. but that it wouldn't have a negative impact on the business process that we could now fairly charge for it, because we put ourselves sort of on the other side of the equation. Yeah. And then in October, finally, uh, we started to charge for it. Yeah. I got two questions in there, right? So one, is there any companies you approached that you thought your vision aligned well with that didn't want the free product? Or did everybody just say, yeah, yeah, we'll take it on and we'll, we're willing to get it implemented? No, no, no. There, there were definitely companies that said no. Yeah. Um, because here's, here's, the, here's the thing at the end of the day, right? Whatever Yelp you know, paid for support to Salesforce or to anybody else, that's still a fraction of the value that you get right. based right. on the service that you deliver to your customers, right? So if somebody just gives you a shitty free product, you can't afford to take it, right? So you have to be open-minded. You have to believe in the vision of the company coming to you. Like there has to be a compelling outside of cost event, mm -hmm. which which is why you would sort of switch to this other product. So that, surely there were a, a handful of companies that we wanted to get early on that said, "Vision is interesting. We can't make the switch right now," or "We're not entirely sure about the vision. You know, we can't make the switch," or "We're interested, but ultimately the executive sponsor couldn't get it to a point where it was approved because it was too risky for their." You know, sort of business process. Yeah, yeah. and that's the point I was making before. Like the timing with us at Yelp was really good because it was a priority for me, mm -hmm. right? Our customer success team was growing just like the rest of the business, and we were, it was doubling every year. And so we had to get the right platform in place so that we could address yep. the issues and be aware of them. Um, so it was a priority for us, but I also know that we've had, we, I, you know, when I was at Yelp, we had a lot of companies approach us and say, just use our product, just right. use our product. And you don't have the time to do it all. Yep. Right? You don't have the time to work with every one of those. Um, so you do, it has to be sort of this pinnacle moment where it's a priority yep. for both of you guys, yep. right? Um, so that's a great strategy. Um, did you lose any of those? So any ones that did come on, did you lose any of them? Um, not that I can recall. No, I mean, I, mean, I think we... You guys were pretty attentive in the way you, you supported them. So um, I'm going to switch gears just a little bit. So as the company started going, again, this is a Sisley. So as the company started going, how did you, we all know in the SaaS business, right, the churn can be your big, biggest risk. How did you focus on customer retention? What was your strategy? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a really great question. So um, I think it's really important to solve a real issue. Which is to say, you know, there's, a, there's sort of the saying, you want to be a pain medication, not a vitamin. Mm -hmm. You know, if you forget to take your vitamins, you don't really have that much pain, and then you, you wind up not taking them. So in the vitamin business, there's a lot of churn, which is why they have to market so much. But when you have a headache, you'll do anything, you know, to sort of find a solution for it. And so the customer support business process is a core fundamental process that every company has. So we knew we had, you know, sort of that going for us, uh, which is really important. And once you, when, once you sort of implement this product, it's not just a standalone product. You integrate it into other systems, like, you, mm -hmm. uh, like Yelp did. Yelp has, which is why Desk is still used at Yelp, you know, because it's integrated into so many other we, parts we of the organization. We can't get off it. This um, and so, because it was such an important business process, because it required integration to other systems to get it really going, once you made that upfront investment, there was a high likelihood that you were going to stay around a long time. Our retention curve, probably like a lot of sort of SaaS businesses, is there's an early drop-off, mm -hmm. which happens because people don't invest enough and they don't really get it up and running. So you get that sort of early drop-off churn. And then you have, I mean, almost no churn sort of from that point forward. Yep. Um, so I think we were the beneficiary of that. And you always have to go back to your customers, right? The world is changing really quickly. And so even when you start to become an organization that has not 10 customers, but 100, and then 1,000, and then 10,000, you have to find ways to infer what challenges your customers are having. There's lots of great tools to help you see their user experience and where they're falling off. Yeah. And then identify key companies that are going to be representative of sort of segments of your customer base and actually spend time with them to understand if they're still succeeding with the product and what they need. Yep. And we did a lot of that. Yeah, I think it's a great point, right? You got to constantly keep in touch with your customers, and, and, and it's constantly changing, and you got to keep up with it. Um, so, a Sisley extremely successful um, exit, right? It, it exited. So, you started the company in two thousand and nine. You exited in two thousand and eleven. Yeah, right. Like that's a really unrealistic time frame for an eighteen exit, months. Right? Yeah, that was yeah. like in eighteen months. Um, what do you? Why do you think you know in eighteen months you were able to exit that business? Like, what was the the, the, the truth in the pudding there, like what really made that happen? Uh, so I'll tell you the interesting thing. In fact, when we started at Sisley, we weren't thinking about building it to sell. 
like this is the one we wanted to ride um, and build something mm -hmm. um, you know special out of because this was our third sort of support company. We had the first one which went really well, the second one that never really fulfilled its vision, and this was sort of coming back to that vision and wanting to uh, to do it right. And we had this great momentum. I mean, yeah. Companies were coming on board, and, and the venture capital community started to get really excited um, about the company. And at one point in, so we started the company in late 2009. I mentioned we launched with a handful of customers early. We raised our first financing in March of 2010, which at the time, again, 2010 was a hard financing market. It's nothing like it was today. Right. Uh, and we raised $1.7 million after getting 40 no's up and down sort of Sand Hill Road. One firm sort of really believed in us um, and put the money in the company. And then over the next six months, the business started to really grow and great brands came on board. And then we raised another $4 million sort of in November, December of uh, 2010. As part of that round, Salesforce actually came in and invested. Yep. Um, I think they, were, they, they wanted to buy us at that point, but we were way too early, and so they wound up putting in a bit, a bit of money into the company. Moment, momentum continued, and we get to sort of May of the following year, so May of 2011. Um, and now there's a lot of venture capital interest in the business because a lot of their portfolio companies are using Assistly. <laughs> And so VCs will often meet with their portfolios and they'll say, oh, what's an interesting new product you guys are using or what are you seeing? And more and more, they would start to hear assistly, assistly, and they're like, well, what's this company? And so we got a lot of inbound interest uh, from the venture capital community. Uh, and in fact, the firm that we were gonna move forward with is now the firm that I work at uh, called Redpoint. They had a great team and we were really connected. And so I went back to our existing investors and said, we're about to do a meaningful financing. We're about to you know, raise 20 plus million dollars. And one of those conversations with, was with Salesforce because they were an investor. And so they were a, an investor or they were considering to They invest? were an investor. They, they invested in, in November. In that, part November. of that $4 okay. million dollar round, they put a million yep. dollars in. Um, and so I, I get a call and, and the call goes something like, Mark wants to meet with you at his house. And I'd never met you know, Mark Benioff. The investment was, was done by his, his corp dev team. And so of course, I was very excited. I mean, it, you know, he was behind the cloud and, and sort of one of the leading thinkers, if not the leading thinker of SaaS. And, and cloud at the time, and so I go to Mark's house, and, and uh, he, he interrogates me for about an hour and a half. And uh, uh, at the end of it, um, he says, "Well, what question do you have for me?" And I said, "Well, what would you do differently if you were me?" And he said something that, that I think really is connected to me deeply, and I, I sort of share this with, with with you all, which is. He said, there are a lot of entrepreneurs who are product sort of biased entrepreneurs. And that's what I was, I was mm -hmm. deeply passionate about product. And he said, not enough equally focus on go to market. And his belief is that a great company is that the Venn diagram overlap. If you think about, you know, sort of two circles overlapping in the middle, that Venn diagram overlap, a great company is a great product with an equally great go to market. What he said to me is at the time that Salesforce was the same age as a Sicily, which was you know, 12, 14, 15 months at the time, they had 25 salespeople, 25 million in revenue, and were really building mm -hmm. momentum. And I was so proud that we had two salespeople, yep. right? And it really hit me that, that there was a big part of building a big company that I was missing out on. And so that's why we ultimately decided you know, that that was the right path for Assistly, and I would personally get to learn a lot, and we would get to scale and grow the business, which was great. So at that point, you sold, or? Is that at that point, we agreed uh, to do the deal, and then, yeah. you know, it takes a little while to close, and ultimately, the deal uh, closed in September of 2011. Okay, yeah. Um, interesting lesson on the go-to-market strategy, right? I, I, I personally, I've only been here four months, been working with a number of different portfolio companies, and startups in the local area, in the Northeast Ohio area. And I definitely see that being, you know, sort of like, I see a lot of good product, right? A lot of good products. I get the demos, I'm like, these are really great. But it is the go-to-market strategy that need to be tweaked, mm -hmm. right? And where um, I've definitely been trying to help out uh, in that area. So that's interesting to hear that. It's right. critical that, you know, great products die all the time. Yeah. And they don't turn into great companies, which is unfortunate. Right, uh, right. Um, so interesting. So what else? So you reported to Mark Benioff. You got so you exit. You get acquired. Mm -hmm. You go report, you know, to Mark Benioff um, in Salesforce. I, I think it's interesting, right? So what was a Sisley, a fifteen twenty million dollar revenue company at the time? And you go run under Mark a seven hundred and fifty million dollar business line. How do you think that transition from you know you were running scrappy 
15 million dollar yeah. re, you know in revenue type company and I don't know where you were exactly yeah. but somewhere in that range right yeah. and now you're running a 750 million dollar business line under Mark Benioff yeah so a little a little point of correction um, I reported to the president who's a guy named okay. Alex Dion who reported to yep. Mark but I was part of the part of the um, executive team this is actually a really interesting decision when I when I came into the company uh, into Salesforce via the acquisition for the first year I focused fully on Assistly and mm -hmm. converting it into desk.com and sort of scaling that, which was the lower end sort of the market product. And Salesforce already had a support product that was much more for the mid-market and enterprise, which was that uh, $700 million business. A big part of why I joined Salesforce was I wanted to learn. Mm -hmm. like I, I had a hunger and an appetite to learn and grow. That was a big part of sort of the decision matrix for not growing the company as a standalone, but, but joining Salesforce. When the opportunity came up, and I was presented with, with the opportunity to run this big business, I had a little bit of a hesitation because rhythmically it was different than running a Sisley. I still had a deep passion and commitment to sort of the company that we founded, but I also knew that while challenging and different, it would help me build a whole set of new muscles at a very different scale than I had sort of ever done. Mm -hmm. um, there's some people who whose companies get acquired that do something called VIP, which is called Vest in Peace. I was not one of those people. You know, I wanted to jump in the fire and I, and I wanted to learn. And so I was fortunate to get the opportunity. I, I took on the opportunity. When I took over the service cloud business, it was 700 million in revenue. When I left, it was 1.3 billion, uh, which is fascinating. It's kind of a fascinating experience. But, I, but I'll tell you this, and I learned a ton about running sort of a global uh, business. Looking at that business, I think the, the benefit that I brought to that particular business was almost a fresh start kind of beginner's mind. Mm -hmm. And when I looked at the service cloud business, it had predominantly been incredibly successful in B2B companies, companies that served other businesses. And that makes sense because the, the original product at Salesforce was sales cloud and it was a predominantly B2B product. And so service cloud sort of drafted the success of sales cloud, sort of stood on the shoulders of giants, so to speak. But the, the big opportunity that I perceived that we had gone after at Assistly was the B2C opportunity, the businesses that serve sort of consumers. And that is a much bigger market overall in terms of uh, support. And so I was able to help shift our strategy and push us kind of in that direction, which I think helped to accelerate growth. But what helped me there is a bit of that beginner's mind. Yep, yep. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit because um, I think you got a really interesting story. You told it to me earlier, and I think it's a great story to share with the, with the audience. Um, and this is your the, the Mark Cuban. Yeah. Right? Let's Mark Cuban on your board. How did that all come to? How did that happen? Yeah. So um, this was the third company, the the one company that was not a support company, um, and. We had been building it. The, the original premise for that... Uh, that was GUI. That was right. GUI. It was a company called GUI, which we founded in uh, 2004. The original premise, again, we looked at the market uh, and, I, and identified trends, was that more and more people were going to use communication tools in the browser and that the current tools had been sort of legacy one-page applications that you click and you wait, the whole thing refreshes, and click, wait, and the whole thing refreshes. So we built a dynamic, almost desktop-like app in the browser. We were one of the first to do it. And it was for uh, email and calendaring for a mm -hmm. consumer. Mm -hmm. Email calendaring and getting information through these widgets, which is you could sort of set up a dashboard and, and have information brought to you. Um, and everything was, at least in our opinion, starting to go well. And we self-funded the company. Um, and then Gmail came out and gave away two gigs. <laughs> now, if you remember, before that, Microsoft was giving away two megs. And Gmail came out and gave two gigs, and we were like, oh shit, we're in trouble. <laughs> like, there, there is no chance That's that fun. we can compete with that. The, the cost of that was, 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 um, was huge, but we sort of, in the spirit of identifying opportunities, saw that people were using these widgets, and MTV gave us a call. And I'll get to the Mark Cuban story. MTV gave us a call. They were in LA, we were in San Diego. We met with the MTV executives, and they loved our interface and this dynamic idea of these widgets. And they said, can you build those for our properties and distribute them across the web and then give us analytics on how people are consuming uh, that data? And again, we, we kind of followed a customer, like I mentioned, that first company. And that's ultimately what, what GUI became uh, known for. While we were doing that and building out these widgets, I was starting to think about fundraising, because at the time, we had been into the company for two years, never had raised any money, and were you know, sort of using our own 
money that we had made a little bit of along the way mm -hmm. uh, to fund the company. And Mark Cuban was somebody that I had a tremendous amount of respect for, just as an individual. Um, I, I loved his passion, his energy, you know, how he went back and, and, you know, into basketball, which was something that he really deeply cared about as a kid and completely changed the league and the way the teams were run. And at the time, he would write a blog called Blog Maverick. And they were some of the most sort of, I, I thought, insightful, textured, high-fidelity blog posts around running business. And so I, I was a consumer of it. And so I thought one day, well, why don't I reach out to Mark Cuban? to see if why he'll not? invest. Why not, why right? Not? <laughs> uh, I'm Alex Bard. Right? Why not? Why exactly. Bard <laughs> <laughs> um, and so this is, this is such an important part of entrepreneurship, which is hustle, right? You've got to hustle, and it's always a no if you don't ask. And so I sort of started guessing his email address at Blog Maverick. Yep. Uh, I must have sent 100 emails, you know, yeah. with most of them bouncing back. Um, and then I remember one day an email came back. <laughs> and uh, he's like, oh, this is, this is pretty interesting. Can you make a widget for my blog? And I said, sure. And we had, I had the guys go in and, and sort of program. Email. All three email. email. Right. All three email. And the guys program it in, and I sent it along. And he's like, oh, this is, this is really great. Um, and he said, I'm going to be at a, at a game in LA. Again, we're down in San Diego. And I'll come down before the game and spend some time with you guys. Because what I had asked him for was not an investment. What I asked him for was if he would be interested in being an advisor to the company. Mm -hmm. And so he said yes. We went back and forth, and we confirmed the time. And I was ecstatic. And I told the other co-founders, you won't believe this. Mark Cuban is coming to town. This is going to be unbelievable. And it was Still for all three weeks out. All three, email, right? Yeah. And it's a few weeks out. Um, and so the day comes. We're in this tiny little office in downtown San Diego. We're above a hardware store, and we're right next to a psychic. Uh, that, that was our setup. Now, now I don't know how good the psychic was because every time I wanted to see the psychic, she was never there, right? So clearly, the, she just didn't didn't appreciate that I needed help. But that was our setup above a hardware store, right next to a psychic. And so, you know, Mark's supposed to be there at, at I think it was 10 a.m. Yeah. And we we print out this 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 sign on like a dot matrix printer, GUI welcomes Mark Cuban, and we put it in our little window. And it's 10 o'clock, and there's no Mark Cuban. And it's 10.15 and there's no Mark Cuban. And I've got, everybody at the office was so excited. I was so excited. It's like 10.20, there's no Mark Cuban. I started pacing around, sweating, thinking, oh my God, that wasn't Mark Cuban. That was an intern was messing an intern. with me. Right. <laughs> there is no Mark Cuban at the other game. end of this thing. Like, I'm like, oh, this is terrible. Um, and I'm staring out the window, you know, and a black car pulls up. And Mark Cuban gets out of it. I just could not believe it. And he came upstairs. And we wound up spending two hours and lunch with him. And I'll tell you sort of a seminal moment in that that Mark sort of came back and told us about, which was we were going back and forth in this tiny little conference room debating something and talking about our viewpoint on something. And one of my co-founders, Gary, who you know really, really well, my best friend for, for 30 years now almost, um, was debating hotly with Mark on something. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh my god, what are you doing? How are you arguing with Mark Cuban? Right. But in fact, that was the, the thing that, that Mark really latched onto, that we had a passion and a conviction. We were sort of willing to die on the hill for, for something. And ultimately, after lunch, he said, I'll tell you what, why don't I do an investment? Um, and at the time, we just had a term sheet come in from a traditional VC, and we wound up taking um, a lot less from Mark uh, to join our board and, and invest in the company. Here's the interesting thing about that interaction. He doesn't wire money. Now, that, that may be his since changed, <laughs> but he signs a check for everything. And so we got the money in two checks, uh, a check for 50% of it up front, and then you know, three months later, assuming we weren't criminals and we were sort of doing what we said, we got the other 750000 So get a photo you know, of that check signed by Mark yeah. It was amazing. Yeah. And then, you know... Ultimately, GUI was acquired by AOL. So that is, that's awesome. So I know we're, we're, we're it's, this is going by quick. I feel like I can talk to you for hours. Oh, God. But I want to ask two more questions. Um, one is, and I think it's just an incredible message, and I remember the day you told me about this because I think about it a lot, it's the give back. Yep. So maybe just extend that Mark Cuban story and just talk about the, real quick, the, um, the, what you did with Assist Lady. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, I, I think it's a long life. There's a, there's a, uh, there's a Russian saying, which is a giving hand is never empty. And so I always really appreciate when somebody takes a, a chance on somebody. 
when others won't, and Mark took a chance on us, and so and he got a you know a good return for his investment. So when we started Assistly, I gave him a bunch of stock. We I should say we gave him a bunch of stock uh, as sort of a thanks for all of his help in the past, um, and sort of you know and asked for kind of continued support. Now we never asked for money, and we raised you know traditional venture. So he, he uh, didn't he didn't contribute any money to Assistly. He wasn't on the board. You just gave him a percent of equity. Just That's right. A, just in a thank you for helping us with the prior company. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And he got a you know a great return on that. And you know, and to this day, if I were to email Mark today, I actually know his real email address now. I don't have to go through a hundred. <laughs> Uh, but if I email him, he, he sort of gets right back to me, which I think is incredible. Yeah, I think that's a great message. My last question, and then we're going to open it up to uh, to you guys if you have any questions. So, um, my last question is: You are now at Redpoint, mm -hmm. and there are eleven days. That's right. Okay, yeah. so you're still real fresh. Um, what What are just some you know? What are three or four characteristics you're looking for in investors? So not not product, but what are you yeah. looking for in entrepreneurs? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So. This will obviously evolve. Um, I sort of believe in this idea of continuous improvement <laughs> versus delayed perfection. But if I were to, you know, at the highest level, you know, kind of a hundred thousand foot level, say what I'm really looking for. Uh, first, it's a vision I can get really excited about, like genuinely excited about. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason that that's important is because, you know, for the people who are founders in the room, if you can't get people excited about your vision, you're going to have a hard time hiring really great people. Right, right. And you're going to have a hard time getting really great early customers on board. So it just has to be a compelling vision that, that sort of deeply connects to me. That would be number one. Number two is I really do believe it's all about the founders early on. It's critical to build that momentum. And so I'm looking for founders, uh, again, I'll use this sort of the Venn diagram analogy, uh, who are relentless hungry and relentless. This has to succeed, but married with high integrity. There's sort of nothing more important than, than high integrity. Mm -hmm. And so it's this relentlessness and high integrity that don't actually all necessarily always right. um, go together. Yep. Uh, and then the third piece is because of our fund dynamics, and it's important for founders to know this, there's a great book written by Brad Feld that you should read or listen to, it's probably easier to listen to, that gives you insight into venture capitalists and how they think and what are the things that motivate us. Because of our fund dynamics, we have to invest in companies that if everything works out right, can be really big businesses, mm -hmm. right? Doesn't mean that other companies aren't great companies, but our fund dynamics dictate that we have to invest in companies that we believe could be billion dollar companies. Yep. And so I kind of think about those three things, a compelling vision, a founder group that is high integrity, relentless, and if all goes right, because there's a lot of things that can go wrong. It could be a really big business. Yep. All right. Should we open it up to questions? Yeah, let's do it. Anybody have a question out there? I see some hands out. It's a little, it's a little difficult to see with the lights, but I think we've got a microphone up here. Yeah, if anybody just comes up to the mics, we do it that way. Just real quick, that book that you just said, what's the name of the book? Uh, I think it's called Brad Feld's Term Sheet. Thank you. Hi, thanks for Hi. coming out. Um, I have a question in terms of um, building and iterating to uh, serve a need for your customer. How do you make sure you don't back yourself into a corner uh, building a product for a customer with very specific needs? Yeah, that's a really great question. And this is, I sort of uh, talked about this. Uh, you can go down a rabbit hole. You have to be very careful. You have to uh, sort of balance the early needs of your customers with knowing that they're going to be scalable. Right? This is why I said don't pick necessarily one customer. You might have one customer that opens your mind to an opportunity, but you have to test it against a handful of customers to make sure it's applicable. Because you're absolutely right. You can go chasing one customer and build something so hyper-specific to that customer that it closes off your market actually, and you just become a custom development shop. So it takes discipline. There's not a sort of an exact science to it, but what I'd say is if you hear something compelling from one customer, test it against five to ten others and see if there's sort of repeating themes and principles married with your own fundamental belief of what's happening in the market, right? Don't just blindly follow a customer, even if you hear some repetitive thoughts. You have to have your own conviction because you have to live with the business. Uh Good morning. Uh, Good morning. Alex, thanks for coming out here. Uh, I'm familiar with various of the Sand Hill Road companies. Huge fan of Redpoint, primarily Thank because you. of Thomas Turgas and his blog. Um, you have early stage investor 
but there seems to be a big difference between what we call early stage in the Midwest <laughs> and out in the valley in the Bay Area. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so it's actually interesting. So Tomash is amazing. Uh, I, I would highly, and this is not self-serving because I was a consumer of the content before I, I joined Redpoint, but he, he writes a brilliant blog about business and metrics, something else. It's just Tomash at Redpoint, T-O-M-A-S-Z at Redpoint. You could sort of find his blog just to put clarity on what you were talking about. Yeah, it, it's interesting because over the last five years or so, rounds have really evolved. So a seed round five years ago in the Bay Area used to be on average half a million dollars. Now a seed round on average is $1.5 million. Mm -hmm. There's actually fewer seed rounds getting done by volume, but more money going into them. And I think part of that is because a bunch of seed funds have been formed uh, that professionally invest in, in sort of earlier stage. So in the Bay Area, we're seeing kind of one and a half million as an average seed round, which then is going to get you to an A. An A has moved from about three and a half million to roughly six million on average uh, today. Bs are about 13 to 15 million, and then you sort of you know, go from there. So I, I don't know the, the local market as well. I think part of the reason also rounds are going up outside of the fact that there's more money you know, kind of going after them and outside of what's happening in the industry is the Bay Area is really expensive. Right? I think you can take half a million dollars here, my sense is, much further than you can take um, half a million dollars in the Bay Area. So a bit of that is just a response to the local climate and having to compete with these bigger companies that pay engineers and others a lot of money in the, in the rise in real estate costs. So yeah. hopefully that answered the question. Good. Let's take one more question, and I think we're gonna, we'll, uh, we'll wrap this up. Thank you. Um, so. The trend right now, I think Facebook started it, is building a great product and then incorporating uh, revenue streams later. Uh, QR does it too. So uh, I guess with, as an investor or through your experience, how do you say a small bootstrapping startup that could try to build customers and uh, you know, customer over revenue? And, and as an investor, what growth or what traction are you actually trying to see to a, you know, invest in a company that has no revenue or potentially down the line? Yeah, it's a, it's a tough question. There's a bit of art and science there. The, the two companies that you named are both uh, business-to-consumer companies, right, B2C companies. And both of those companies had to get to a tremendous level of scale to then be able to monetize at any reasonable level. And I think that actually in today's market on a business-to-consumer end, it's harder to get to that level of scale uh, than it has been in the past. It's much harder in the Apple App Store to get out of the noise because there's tens of thousands of apps now. It used to be much easier when Apple's mm -hmm. platform was new. Uh, it's harder to get distribution on Facebook. There used to be these viral loops and coefficients on Facebook that would help you sort of piggyback on their growth. You can't do that anymore. A lot of that is uh, sort of locked down. So I actually think from a business to consumer perspective, it's harder than it's been before to get to really meaningful scale and then to start to think about monetizing. Although you still can, right? I, I don't think these are absolutes. In B2B, businesses to businesses, um, I think you, you ultimately know if you have a product that's chargeable, and as a, as a, you know, as a newly minted VC that's 11 days you know, into the business, I understand that world, and I could look at a product, and I could look at where it's been implemented, and I could look at the value that it delivers, and I can interview those customers to see if they would have been willing to pay for it, and I can extrapolate that to what the future of the company looks like. And I can understand sort of the unit economics of that. So it, you don't necessarily need revenue, but I think on the B2C side, it's much harder to get to breakout scale. On the B2B side, I think there's still opportunities and you can extrapolate that better. All right. Well, that went by quick. I could. I, I would have liked it another hour, or another hour or two. I think we could have talked all day. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, first of all, I want to thank all of you for, for being here for the first session, for being here for the day uh, at Startup Scale-Up. Uh, and help me, please, in thanking Alex Bard for today.